knowledge that were in the NCA grant, the grant of the skilled people. And uh, it was really great to hear Richard because he's, to me, a really great mentor. And it was, I feel like the whole beginning has been great. Really great to hear your presentation, Steve, and, and to have uh, that moment to honor uh, those of, of, that have gone before us and really paved those roads. So, yeah, so I'm actually going to just go into here and uh, use this, since we have these fabulous, wonderful, gigantic monitors here, <laughs> screens and monitors, and just talk about um, my practice. So I am an interdisciplinary artist, and I have been practicing art for a quarter of a century, so weird to say that. <laughs> yeah, I've been making art a long time. Um, I think art has been like the biggest medicine tool for me, and I'm going to just start off with putting my blog up here, and, uh, and it shows, well it's a couple things, it's going to now say it's a film, so I'm going to have to So um, a number of years back, my dear friend Kamala Todd wanted to do a film about uh, about Vancouver and wanted to really shine the light on a character in Vancouver. And she's like, "You're that character." I'm like, "Oh my God, that's what I'm." <laughs> I am a character, and I am definitely really big about Vancouver. Anyway, so I've I've been I created this blog after uh, years after that movie was made. It was a short film that was like nine minutes and it traveled all over the place, even went to cons and uh, it's like, wow, <laughs> places our little images go. We don't get to go there, but we're seen there. It's really kind of fun. And, but I wanted to like create something that people could uh, come and learn from and look at, look at things like plants and learn about uh, the important elements of what they do for us and you know especially after we've just heard that beautiful talk from Richard you know I think part of me like when I started this blog thought am I am I creating a cheat sheet for people or am I encouraging them to get on the land and introduce themselves and um, you know, there were a lot of things that Richard said that stuck out for me, and, and the big thing was holding and feeling plants in our hands. And I have the incredible honor to have a, a, a very lovely little granddaughter now, which uh, she's turning two in a few weeks. So I'm like, woo! Yeah. Um, and the thing that I've been doing since she was born is going on the land and just having her feel the tiniest leaves and the biggest leaves, just touching things, and we talk about it, and I, you know, I whisper all the secrets of those plants into her ears, um, as well as lots of decolonial, anti-colonial, and smash the state stuff, that all goes into. <laughs> like how do we raise, uh, how do we change the future? We, we raise our children to know know what things are and how they're about. And just to note the photo here, a lot of people would look at that and go, oh, that's a that's an estuary at low tide. That's interesting. But it's actually subtly more than that. It's a fish weir that has been maintained by the people in my village uh, for probably for at least the last 50 years on this site because uh, this is a new estuary. As, uh, as we say, you know, development comes in, it's never progressive, but it's always seen as progress. Let's go in and shape, reshape the land. And this estuary at, uh, up until 50 years ago was the forest. And we see a train bridge off there in the background. And, um, and so the Capilano estuary was shifted when a dam was put, put into place. And, um, and that is where we, in, in a very urban environment, uh, go fishing for coho and other salmon. And, the, and often the young men are in the river up to their knees, 
uh, shifting those rocks, and so you can kind of see a visual pattern in there, and that's, that's all from these guys constantly going down, and then they go back up on the bridge, and they watch, they watch the way the salmon come in, and then they go back down, and they, they fiddle around some more, and they often have an elder up there going, you know, like this, you know, just pointing, and, and uh, or, you know, doing the lips thing, like, like, using our lips to point, but the, it, it's really inspiring to me when I see uh, our people utilizing modern technologies and resources to still go back to doing exactly what we've done for centuries. And so, you know, those guys, their families have constantly been working with the river because the river changes every day that the water moves over those rocks. They, they shift. And that's because water is the most powerful force on Earth. So they have to go down in the river and they have to constantly keep reshifting those rocks uh, those beautiful grandfathers, and they have to listen to their elders, you know, even if they're cold, even if it's a cool day, uh, they're down there in their shorts, and they're shifting rocks, and they're listening, because they know that if they don't, we're not going to, you know, be able to get the salmon up, and we're not just trying to get as many salmon as we can, because there's so few, but we want, it's how we help those salmon get up to to the riverbeds to lay their eggs. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about what land-based practice means to me and how working on the land uh, is an important part of my my practice and always has been. Even when I started, um, even when I started working with media, I, I at first felt like I was cheating too. But then I was like, no, I'm going to use this as the means to uh, convey my messages, but also to work through my shit, you know? Because as artists, we have to work through our shit. We all have it, you know? I, ha I had a really good chuckle this fall. I did an indigenous decolonization uh, permaculture course with all powerful, strong indigenous women in Seattle, and I drive there every week just to do this work. And, study how to make maps and compose on our white professors that didn't get us and were trying to tell us about indigenous knowledge. And at the, uh, you know, at the convergence we went to where we all met each other, uh, there were several people I talked to about humanure, you know, and I was like, oh, humanure equals dealing with our shit, literally. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, it was really interesting to to find out, you know, how all these people were mostly predominantly older hippies, how they had actually spent years devising systems to create their uh, use of their own shit to grow things without contaminating their foods and without uh, damaging the earth. And it made me think that as artists, we really have a lot to learn about that. And I actually have a really, uh, I have these dear friends that own Grand Og Ales up in um, Sorrento, and they used humanure in a lot of their uh, work on the, on the site. Okay, so, um, environmental art, it's Stanley Park and Environmental Art Project. Actually, this little picture here is great. It's just going to show the whole thing. But um, So I worked on this project with uh, Davide Pan, and he is he is an uh, Italian artist, and we thought it would be really fun to be a settler indigenous team working on the land, working on um, projects that that all had to do with the land. And uh, Antonia, who's sitting here today, she was also part of this project. So there was uh, a few teams that were set aside and. Davide and I submitted a, a project proposal uh, with the help of his sister, and we we just both wanted to bring our connections of that park to life. I grew up in Stanley Park, knowing little bits and pieces of stories around the island that we call Stanley Park. It's actually a peninsula, and. Um, and my stories come from 
the sources of the names, like the, that peninsula is actually known as Chai Thus, not as Stanley Park. That uh, village sites like Akachok, uh, which is where Beaver Lake is, that is now turning into a bog, exists. Uh, where the, one of the most prominent places that people go around, they go past the uh, totem poles and out into this big jetty in the back, and, uh, and it's actually an elbow, and it's called Papoya, which means elbow. Um, and, and how there's a, there was a, when the land surveyors came, and people came in and started sawing things up, uh, they saw, they were sawing up our, our longhouses while we were living in them, because their tapes wouldn't go through the walls. And we all know today, people do surveying, but they measure that now. But that wasn't taken into consideration with our people. So it was a real, like there were a lot of positive and negative stories that went on. And the biggest thing is that this big storm happens in 2007, and 10,000 trees fall down. And all over the city I hear people going, oh, this, it's so sad. And I'm like, why? Well, the trees fell down. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to understand why it's a sad time for you, because as indigenous people, we're like, art supplies? First of foremost, <laughs> and most artists in the city knew this too. Uh, food, the resources. So Davide and I were standing in front of a stump here that uh, was hollow and had been knocked over in the park. People came and put it back up. And I went around the site and collected, um, I went around to every cedar tree, each cedar stump on the site and I went into the middle of them, because as you can see, this one's hollow. As cedar trees grow, they uh, become, uh, they start to decay in the middle. And that's actually one of the reasons why our people could take down these 1,600-year-old cedars, and if they fell the right way and broke them. And then I went around and dug up plants, because we were, <laughs> you know, me and Kenny and I can giggle about this, but we weren't allowed to bring anything into the park to plant. And I'm like, well, I've, I don't really need to, I can just go around and dig up plants and replant them. So I, our project was looking at nurse stumps and nurse logs, and uh, Davide did a bunch of, uh, he, we had a little, like, uh, you know, tiger torch, and he, he was uh, really pretty agile, but he brought some hangers, some old hangers, and bent them with a little uh, crescent wrench, and fires and made letters and burned them into the to the stumps as I was doing things. We'd have this conversation. I gave him the, the names of, of everything in Skolmish Snechum and he uh, wrote things in English and we talked about how you know the, the forest is telling us these things all the time. Hi, I'm Salal, hi, I'm Huckleberry, I'm Deerfern, I'm you know, Hemlock. So but we were putting the names of plants onto stumps, and we filled this one up. And I think I, I think it was like four years later, I was at the stump with a group of like young punk rock teenagers, street youth, and I'm like, "Yes, yeah, so we're gonna talk about this." And they're all like snarling at me. Yeah, okay, whatever. What's what's so cool about this? And then I peeked in, and I'm like, "Oh my god, be really quiet, come over." And they're like, "What?" And they all peeked in, and we saw a duck laying on its eggs in this stump. And it had by then also grown many other plants. And so we were just talking about how this this little stump became uh, like it was nursing all this life, including being a, a house for this little duck and its and its uh, babies. And a week later, I went. There was a little string of the of the eggs that had cracked open as they all came out and tumbled out of the stump and probably went off to the ocean to go for a swim. So it was wonderful, that project was really wonderful because what it did was help us to um, to look at how creating art, uh, we can be interfering in society or we can be adding to it. We can complement it, we can take care of it, or we can damage things, you know, and we, we see both. and. Uh, there's a lot of elements that we can do that can can make things better or worse. But uh, we really hope that, I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to be okay if I download an app on here, if it's going to, can I download an app on this? I should have asked this earlier. Can I just try? <laughs> I'm going to get great. <laughs> okay, so 
Now, um, I recently just did a project, I'm kind of zooming through things, and I'm trying to show you different elements of my work that so I've been on the lab doing things, but um, I spent a lot of years troubleshooting with different people like Elizabeth Ponce, who's an indigenous gamer, and working with Loretta Todd through the Aboriginal Think Tank, and then, um, and then I got into, I see, I just, I don't know how I can actually. You can't download an app on a PC. Okay, thank you. All right, well then I, what I can tell you though is that you can, this will actually come up as a picture. Yeah. Um, so you can see the window here and right here is, it's, uh, this is what you'll get when you download this on your uh, smartphone, iPhone, or whatever you have, Android. And you go to the bottom of the screen and you download Polygon, but it just says app, and this is what you get is this little app here. So the Polygon outside is um, a project that I was hired last summer after doing a bunch of walks and talks on what North Vancouver is calling the Spirit Trail, and they're all happy about the Spirit Trail, it's so great get out and cycle and walk and do things. And there's a lot of positive things about it, but there's also this contention where my community intersects at Welsh and Capilano specifically. And it actually intersects through all of Aslahan. But specifically at Capilano and Welsh, uh, it's a really big artery for traffic. A lot of people don't understand that that road is what indigenous people call a, cut a cutaway. And it was literally cut away from our land. Like we're the, you know, the Indian agents and the name of the crown gave us some of our land back. It's really how it was termed, and, and I'm almost quoting it out of the research I read 25 years ago. And I'm like giving us our air back, that's, or giving us our land back. That's ridiculous. Um, so I watched the way people interact at Capilano and Welsh, and in different parts of the Spirit Trail. And, and along that spirit trail is our spirit trail. And it's an indigenous uh, uh, space. And it's right parallel with the spirit trail. And often people be going along there and they look over and they see this dirt road with the yellow gate and they want to go down there. And believe me, people go down. And what's there are a bunch of sacred ceremonial spaces like sweat lodges and medicine wheel. And it's where people go to deal with their shit, basically but also to take care of themselves in good ways, not just getting rid of things, but building themselves up. So I, I often refer to that as our spirit trail, and then there's that other spirit trail. I, I've done a couple of, ex oh, it's a garbage dump for non-native people, but it's not for our people. So one day I picked up a chair and a plastic bag of garbage, and I walked across the street, and I placed it in the middle of the other spirit trail. <laughs> And it took five minutes for somebody to stop. The first person that came along was like, what? what is this doing here? And I was standing nearby. Did you see this? I was like, yeah, I put it there. Why would you put it there? I said, because it was in our spirit trail. And I put it in this spirit trail. I want to see what your reaction is. Well, we don't like it. I said, well, we don't like it in the forest. Neither do the coyotes or the marmots that have shown up from the mountaintop. There's marmots in our forest by the water. That's actually pretty major. <laughs> They're a high mountain creature. Um, but they're all getting, like, all these animals are getting driven down there. We have rare pollinators that live there. And so it's a really sacred space, and it's the only piece of watershed left between Horseshoe Bay and Cates Park. And that's about 10 miles of everything else is industry but this pocket, and that's where all these sweat lodges are. And uh, so I really wanted to find a way, how can I communicate my annoyances without being that, you know, the angry person at the corner every day, but, uh, so then I talked a lot about this project I did through Alternator Gallery a number of years ago with other artists called History of the Future, and I, with, I went back to my work with Elizabeth LaPonce, and she and I and Darcy O'Connor created this geocaching idea, which five years later became a thing, so I really attribute Elizabeth LaPonce, an indigenous gamer, for coming up with a worldwide uh, scavenger hunt idea online. And it, because all of the, everything I've read in all of the sites all go back to her language that she wrote. 
And she wrote that based on a blog I wrote called Techno Medicine Wheel. And that was, uh, that was I think, six years prior to really, like, I think at that time we only had Friendster, <laughs> as far as, uh, and, um, you know, a few of those other ones I don't even want to remember the names of. <laughs> but you can remember how uh, online communities were kind of lame back in the day and kind of struggling. Well, and I came up with this idea of techno medicine wheel, and, and I, I still laugh today about how people say, oh, so you want to put images online and have people talk about it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> okay, well, one day you will. And you will laugh at yourself. <laughs> So, you know, so I look at the at that one project and how that grew from being this idea of being in an interactive uh, online community where you could post, you know, words or pictures or sound clips or whatever. And, uh, you know, Facebook came along and exploded. And then I still kept troubleshooting through this. And I, then I created the geocaching game through History of the Future. It was only on for three months online. But... I was really excited about it, and I went around my community, and I placed little geocache boxes with uh, these little homie dolls. Everything had to fit in a small box, and I wanted to focus on little people. So I put homie dolls that I was going down to Bond's Cafe in East Van to, to buy, because it was the only place I could find them. So I was literally saving my, my toonies and loonies to go buy these little dolls. I was collecting wooden paddles from my cousin that makes the animals, and, <laughs> and then I went to the dollar store and got erasers and sharpeners. And, uh, and then I got, actually donated a bunch of little tiny booklets from the unit pit when they were uh, starting Vancouver Publishing House. So I just kind of did the, the smart hunter-gather thing. I went around the land and got my tools and I bought these little I argued with myself about putting plastic on the land, because um, I hate that idea. And there are all these things that worked but didn't work, and the, the biggest thing that didn't work was everybody in my community stole the boxes. And I find them in their houses years later. Like, Where did you get that? And they're like, I'm telling you. I'm like, I made that. And they're like, whatever. And it actually says on the box, do not review. <laughs> They're like, we don't care, we didn't need that. We wanted what was in there. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Including one of the lodge leaders, I found it at the lodge. I'm like, mm-hmm, okay. <laughs>